My name is Franck Bové and I'm the director of Ne croyez surtout pas que je hurle that is shown at the forum. J'ai 45 ans. Je vis depuis 6 ans en appartement dans un minuscule et pittoresque village d'Alsace Bossu situé à une cinquantaine de kilomètres de Strasbourg au cœur du parc régional des Vosges du Nord. Je me suis séparé il y a de cela 7 mois du compagnon avec lequel nous avions décidé de nous installer là dans le but de vivre à proximité de la nature et de nous loger plus confortablement que nos revenus ne nous l'autorisaient à Paris. Je connaissais le village pour y avoir précédemment tourné un court-métrage et parce que ma mère, après son remariage, s'est installée dans une commune voisine. Au moment de la rupture, je me retrouve sans permis de conduire dans ce bel endroit isolé où les allées et venues de chacun sont observées derrière les rideaux voilés des fenêtres, uniformément bordées de jardinières de géranium. Le dialecte alsacien est omniprésent, je n'entends que rarement parler français. Un français à la grammaire agonisante, malmené par les germanismes. Hello and welcome to the 33rd Teddy Award. I'm Hannah Condon and I'm here with director Franck Bovey to discuss his film Just Don't Think I'll Scream. Hi Frank, nice to have you here today. Hi, thank you for having me. Uh, can you begin by giving a bit of an explanation as to or the background of what escalated the events that, that you describe in the film? So uh, why did you sort of do this self-imposed exile to Alsace? Mm. <coughs> Sorry, I have to ask the last part of the question. So again. why did you uh, do this self-imposed exile, this sort of retreat to Alsace that we see in the film? Well, the beginning of the exile was a happy story. Because I I met uh, I I met my I met a boyfriend in Paris, mm -hmm. and we decided to retire from Paris <coughs> to live closer to nature. My mother was living nearby, so we found a, fl a flat that was really un unexpensive, and I thought it would be easier for me to be far from Paris to write and to reflect on, on my work. So we spent five years very happily there and the relation came to an end. And then it started to really look like an exile. And uh, at the time I began to suffer from isolation. My boyfriend had a car and a, dri and a driver's license. I haven't. Mm -hmm. So I was really alone in this very, very, very small village with almost no one I, I knew except for my mother. And I looked for an opportunity to go back to Paris. But again, flats are so expensive and I wasn't working on a movie at that time. So it was postponed all the time. And there was this possibility of joining um, Wohngemeinschaft, uh, uh, to be a roommate somewhere. But no, but no date. I had to wait that the person decided to leave the apartment. <coughs> so I knew I, I would leave, but I didn't know when. And I told myself, why not try to write about this this time and this expectancy of leaving, and try to connect the state I was in with some of the events of the world that were also making me suffer in, in a different way. Uh, and that was the, the starting point uh, of, of the idea and of the movie. Yeah. And so you watched 500 films in this very short space of time. And throughout the film, you sort of start talking about um, films starting to seem like mirrors as opposed to windows. And then actually images of mirrors do come up quite a lot. Can you explain that motif a little bit? Of course. Uh, 
the, the idea of working on f found footage was that watching movies, there were sometimes uh, very short snippets, subliminal images that I thought were di directly could be out of my life. Mm. Uh, so they reflected something back at you? Yeah. yeah. And I decided just, just to collect these precise images uh, and to try to n narrate not so much my life, but my, the state I was in through, uh, through these images. Yeah. And, but it was sometimes landscapes. It was just, wow, this, this forest is looking just like the forest I had uh, across my street. Yeah. Or uh, this, this portrait, it's incredible. She, she looks just like my mother. Yeah. Uh, maybe, I was not sure it was possible, but maybe I, I, I could really do uh, the story uniquely using found precisely stolen footage. Yeah. yeah. And because you're sort of documenting your own personal experience and personal state of mind so much, how did you find the process of putting the films together afterwards? Um, so the process of actually, you know, putting them in the order that you did yeah. and looking back at the state of mind that you were in. How did you find that process? The first thing I did was listing the movies I had seen, yeah. then re-watching them all, extracting all, all the images one by one, and systematically. Uh, I have this rule of the game, which is never use a shot uh, with the face of a known actor. Okay. Uh, and I, I have this fascination for uh, all the shots uh, that do not include actors. Yeah. <laughs> so I took them all out, and it was, I think we started with 26 hours okay. of snippets. Wow. <laughs> and then I contacted the, the editor I usually work with. <coughs> we had done short, short found footage films before, and we worked the same way we had worked before. It was like um, selecting, the putting all the snippets in uh, specific uh, case, uh, uh, cases. Yeah, mm. uh, like this is to me. This evokes violence. This is sex. Yeah. This is blood. And sometimes it, it was totally abstract notions. Sometimes very concrete animals or. Uh, Faces from extra uh, parts of the body. Mm -hmm. So we had this index, and I had to get familiar with all these images to start writing. Yeah. So at the time I knew we have these 26 hours. I really wanted to go on further, and my editor just said, uh, now we need a text. Yeah. <laughs> so please do something. Yeah. Uh, ri writing is a very hard, hard process for me. Okay. Uh, but it's very poetic, the, the narrative that you wrote. It's very lyrical, thank you. flowing. Narrative. But it's not... Uh, <laughs> It's hard for me to, to get that work. I always uh, think of something better to do than to, yeah. to work. <laughs> I'd rather watch a movie. Mm. But then there was no choice. Uh, so I went back to the place I left. I went back to my mother. I took two weeks. And I imagined a process which was like, I get up at noon. I read for two hours mm. to get a sense of, uh, of the music of the authors uh, I respect yeah. or I, I'm fond of. And then, and then I write one and a half pages because I knew that if I stayed 
two weeks and wrote one and a half pages a day, it would be enough. Yeah. And that's exactly how uh, so the writing process went on. We corrected a few things afterwards, but <clears throat> not that many. And then we went back to the editing room for quite a while. There was like six more months. And first what we were doing was, I, I, recorded, I recorded the voice. We were, we were running the voice. And we, we took each of these uh, thematic uh, indexes, like violence, and we watched two hours of violence over, over the text. Yeah. And we tagged, we tagged the places where we thought it would be interesting for these images to stay put all the rest out, and we were filling the blanks uh, further and further and further. Yeah. And of course, we at some point, we knew the images very well, so we didn't have to work it haphazardly. Uh, uh, I, I would remind, uh, there is a roulette. Let's use this roulette after the eye. Yeah, there. sounds like a jigsaw it, puzzle. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a jigsaw puzzle. But it's fascinating and it's very p playful. Mm. Uh, it's very playful. It, it was really uh, the editing was a really nice time, a happy time after the suffering of uh, what I'm telling in, in, in the movie. Yeah, just so I suppose on the note of it being a bit playful, some of my favourite uh, scenes, if you can call them that, um, were when the images sort of challenged the talk, the bit of the narrative. So. The particular one I was thinking of was uh, when you're talking about um, the church and sort of this very conservative values of the church, and then and we the have this. <laughs> I was actually thinking of the one where it almost looks like a wooden dildo in, yeah. in the church. Um, I just wondered, sort of, how did you how did you choose which bits you wanted to actually illustrate the narrative, and which images you actually wanted to most challenge the narrative or mm -hmm. yeah question what the narrative said. Well. We knew from the beginning on that being totally illustrative wouldn't work and was counterproductive. Mm. Uh, so I was looking for a kind of balance between uh, some, sh some shots that would be metaphorical, yeah. some that would be more like a, a joke or that kind of reference <laughs> to dildo yeah. speaking about religion. But I also, I also knew, we also knew that we needed some of them to be illustrative uh, for not to lose totally the viewer. I'm always uh, trying to put myself in the place of uh, the spectator, yeah. uh, trying not to be boring, yeah. not to be too rep uh, repetitive. Uh, but sometimes it comes from itself. There are some subjects. Yeah. <laughs> Talking about re religion or conservatism, you, you can really um, laugh easily with, with images that are on the total opposite of what you're saying. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that answers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and I suppose on the similar theme, um, a lot of the images are these sort of like they challenge the narrative or they're quite cheeky often in a slightly sexually suggestive way and um, quite a lot of shots of like crotches just right next to other much more conservative images um, and I wondered if that was specifically trying to engage with queer film techniques or if that was just a sort of a coincidence that there are similarities uh, it was not conscious mm. but unconsciously probably as we mentioned I am Little, literally eating films all yeah. day long. So, uh, of course, I'm familiar with the, the work of, uh, I don't know, people like Naomi Human or uh, Peggy Ashway or that, that, uh, this kind of people. Mm. I'm thinking it's mostly women. Yeah. <laughs> Chantal Ackerman, of course. Uh, but I had no real. Uh, he was not conscious uh, to refer to, to to that. 
Yeah. Uh, but I think it's in, it's in me. Yeah. So, so it, it just pops out. Uh, and of course, these are filmmakers I, I do respect. Uh, I do respect a lot. Mm. Um, also, of course, to quote gay ones, uh, the, uh, the joie jo jo I'm talking about the film. Um, Jean-Pedro Rodrigue is a very, very uh, close friend. And I think that subconsciously, subconsciously, uh, you're contaminated in a way by by your friends and their and their movies. Yeah. I also thought um, that it's always a painfully detailed documentation of <coughs> what is. I mean, I don't know. Would you call it depression? The stage you you were in, mm. uh, and to the extent that the viewer almost becomes absorbed in that, so you start to. Or I felt that the images, I started to recoil from the images as well, in the mm -hmm. same way that you were narrating this sort of film bulimia, this feeling of there being almost something disgusting about the amount of films. Um, I wondered if that was an intentional uh, aspect of the film that you were trying to get other people to understand the depressive state of mind. Absolutely, mind. absolutely. I tried to work these specific moments or, or the the anguish crisis or the, my father's death. Mm. I knew I had to work with shorter sentences uh, to find a rhythm that would be uh, closer to slam, uh, to, to uh, convey this feeling of uh, annihilation and, as, and asphyx, asphyxiation. And that the rhythm ha uh, of the images also had to change. The death of my father, there are many uh, black parts, <coughs> and there are images, and then it's black and images, like in a nightmare of like flashes of uh, pain painful memories. Yeah. And the, ang the anguish uh, crisis, <coughs> I wanted to be really faster, faster than the, the rest of the rhythm of the movie. Or, or the day after, after uh, the bombing in Nice uh, was, also, was also a moment when I thought it had to be very, very, very fast. And then naturally when you go back to the description of a, of a village where nothing ever <laughs> happens, yeah. you, can go, you can go slower. Yeah. And finally I wanted to ask uh, you talk about the, the conservative values of Alsace where you were staying and this isolation. Mm. What is it like living as a gay man in this very conservative small village? Actually, I think it's pretty complicated. Basically, they're, they're, they're voting largely uh, for the right to extreme right wing mm -hmm. and they are conservative people but it's also a very small community and being a small community they have no choice but to include the people they live with and even if I'm sure everybody would have voted against gay marriage there was like Two weeks after it was authorized, there was a gay marriage in the village. Yeah. <coughs> two, elder, two, elder, two elder people, two elder men. Yeah. And everybody was, was nice with them. And it was a kind of coming out for them at that time. So would, would, would act as if we were roommates by boyfriend. Mm. It's just like, I'm not, uh, I had times in my life where I, when I had relations with girls, but either with girls or with boys, I'm not demonstrative. I think intimacy is something I keep at home, so I would not uh, go out holding hands or kissing in, in the outside. So I think most of the people knew. Yeah. But they would treat us like brothers, <coughs> roommates, or uh, they were not exactly nice, but 
they were not uh, aggressive. And it was the same for, we had a few, very few stra strangers coming in the village, black-skinned people. So that was the first time where everybody says, we don't want, uh, we don't want any uh, immigrant here. And you come back two months later, and they're already assimilated, mm. and they forget. Uh, so I'm, uh, I have some hope. Yeah. Because uh, I think when it's small community, in small co smaller communities, it's easier to integrate what is the natural self. Yeah. Because you notice more easily that everyone is normal or as yourself and that the difference are just fantasies, uh, political fantasies to oppose, to oppose people. Uh, so I would not say uh, it was that bad an experience. Isolation was uh, an experience, but I didn't experience any direct homophobic statement ever. Thank you so much for talking to us today. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and, uh, well, have a last Good last day at the Berlinale because you're heading home this evening. Irene, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>